two, a couple more? Okay. Um, so Swiss stamps, Helvetia appears on Swiss stamps. Um, it's one of the few countries that doesn't have their country name in English or native language um, because Helvetia is Latin for Switzerland. Huh. And it comes from the Helvetii people that lived in that part of Europe during the Roman age. And that's where the name kind of came, or that's where I read that the name comes from. So um, that's why Helvetia's on Swiss stamps. Um, there's several specialized um, catalogs that specialize in Switzerland. One of them is uh, the Swiss Stamp Dealers Association. And that's this catalog here, the one on the far right. This is an older version, mine. And this one, uh, this catalog, there's kind of a huge controversy about numbers in Switzerland. There's, do you go by the Swiss um, stamp dealers or do you go by the Zumstein catalog, which a lot of people know. So Zumstein's just a private company that's been selling stamps and printing catalogs for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. And the Stamp Dealers Association runs this catalog here. Um, this catalog I like, um, if you're gonna collect Switzerland, I would highly encourage you to pick up a, a used catalog on eBay or something because there is way more, as with most countries, there's way more in these catalogs than what appears in Scott. Are they in English? Uh, no. Well, yes, there is, uh, there is some English in them, but mostly it's German. Mm -hmm. But now with Google Translate, you can get that. And there's a lot of photos and stuff. So, you know, but that's why we have a club. I speak fluent German, so <laughs> I've got an advantage to that. But, um, right. yeah, we've helped each other. I also have this version, mm -hmm. which is spiral bound, and it's in German and in French. So. Yeah. You can yeah. kind of figure it out. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there's lots of, I'll pass this around, these around, but there's lots of pictures in here showing different, you know, Scott will talk about type one and type two in the reprint of a stamp. There's a lot of pictures in here of exactly what they're trying to tell you. You know, Scott may describe it like there's a line above, three lines above the, the value, and this shows those three lines. So... It's been extremely helpful with that. The other thing too is there are varieties in here that are not in the Swiss catalog, or I mean in the in Scott catalog. And I've been fortunate to pick up some pretty nice varieties because the person didn't know what they had. Um, I think we've all done that over the years. So, um, and then I just like the way it's organized. They organize, the Swiss are very organized, so it's got these colored tabs on the side. And, you know, so you go to the different categories such as uh, the early stamps, airmail, two different semi-postals, all the blocks are together. And then there's the, the back of the book, the, the officials and things like that. Then they have, uh, hotel stamps in here, which are unlisted in the Scott catalog. And they have train stamps in here uh, that paid for parcel parcel uh, rates on items being shipped via train because they ship a ton of stuff on the train or they, they certainly used to. And then I never, this, I'd never seen this in older catalogs, but they actually put some coin values in here, which is kind of interesting, some Swiss coin values. So I'll pass that one around. Um, are the numbers of Scots no, totally absolutely different. not. In fact, that's part of the controversy. The numbers are different in there than in Zoomstein. But that catalog lists both numbers, which is nice. So you can cross-reference really easy. Those two were Scott. Uh, no, that lists these. Um, uh, the thing, the Zoomstein does not, the Zoomstein lists the Michael number. So they cross-reference <laughs> each other, which is kind of, oh yeah, it's a bad like I said, they fight. There's a big, there's a big thing about which catalog should be used in Switzerland. But again, this catalog here um, has this one is pretty useful um, uh, for some stamp stuff. There are also some really, and I shared this last time. There are some really neat charts in here when you're doing the early stuff. You can actually set the stamp right up to this, and if you're in the right perf, it'll just exactly match. It's like having a better perf gauge. 
And then it also tells, so you have to figure out the watermarks. We'll talk about watermarks in a minute. But you can set it right up there, and then it tells you what number to go to, and you flip to that page. Yep, that's the stamp. So it just makes researching some of that really early standing uh, Helvetia Switzerland stuff makes it pretty easy. Um, and then there's, uh, I'll get into the watermark, but this book is extremely helpful for the watermarks too. So this one, uh, this one actually, when they print it, has a lot of the same stuff as the dealer's catalog, but in the back it also has Liechtenstein because Liechtenstein is in partnership with Switzerland on a lot of things, and uh, while they issue their own stamps, the catalog has Liechtenstein in it. Uh, that one used to, but starting that year, they actually split it out, so you combine it separately. The tough thing is, is both these books are, I mean, the, to find an older one on eBay is great. You cannot buy a new one. They will not ship it out of Switzerland. <laughs> so you can't get I can't get my hands on a 2023 I gotta know somebody or something like that I can get one that's a few years old or sometimes I find them out of England but they want like $60 from when they're $25 and they're they're charging 60 because the demands there do so they, do they have a reason why they won't let it I don't know I don't know if it's an import export yeah I don't know if it's an agreement with a publisher no idea I have no idea why you cannot buy it. they won't even ship it to Germany if you're from Switzerland <laughs> so, um, which is a shame because I go on the post office website and they have it advertised, but I can't get it. Um, then this other book I have, which is a bit older, but still very useful because it shows different stuff than those, is the uh, Michelle um, uh, Switzerland Liechtenstein Special, Specialized Catalog. And again, same thing. This one's more black and white uh, on some of the drawings and stuff. There is color stamp photos, but you really gotta you really gotta know some German to, to get into this one. There's a lot of it's more more writing than uh, pictures in there. Um, but again, you know, with Google Translate, you can hold your phone up there and it'll translate it right then and there, which is pretty cool. Um, so anyway, so I don't use this one so much for value other than variety stuff when I'm really digging into uh, Switzerland. Uh, I've never had one, but there's Stanley Gibbons makes a Switzerland one uh, also. So the next thing would be some of the early Swiss stamps, and you guys can read there. Uh, two of the earliest Swiss stamps. Um, were the Zurich and Geneva. This one, the green one here is the Geneva and the grayish one is the Zurich. Um, the the uh, Geneva one is pretty rare as there were only 60,000 printed and only 6,000 were used over a 10 year period. <laughs> so it was out there for a long time and not many were used. And that's because this was essentially um, the fourth stamp ever printed in the world. So the idea of having postage on an envelope was very new still. Um, and the reason why, so in Zurich, the, the cantons, the states in Switzerland were kind of setting some of their own postage rates still. And so four was in city and six was out of the area. And in Geneva, the 10, the two together was out of area and the five was in the canton. So if it was going to Zurich, you'd pay 10 to get it to Zurich, but if it was going to the next town over, you'd pay five. And so the stamp was meant to be cut in half. So you can see that stamp, half of it on an envelope and know how it was used, or you can see the entire on an envelope and know how it, how it was used. They were only valid in country. They, I believe so. Yeah, I believe those two were meant for in-country. Um, again, the Universal Postal Union hadn't been right. organized yet, and stamp, the, the whole letter thing was still in its infancy. Um, now what, what denomination was this? Those were Rothen uh, cents, basically Swiss cents. Uh, 100 Swiss cents is a franc, a one franc. 
So um, yeah, so it was five five cents and, and or ten cents or four or six if you were up in Zurich. So um, there's only about six hundred of these preserved, both on and off cover, that are real. Um, and the uh, and because of that, they are that stamp. I think uh, oh, it retails at least for sixty thousand dollars. Yikes! It's very very expensive. It's probably something I'll never own. In fact, I would almost rather have to fake one in my in my uh, album <laughs> just to have the whole filled, you know. Keep but uh, yeah, so it's pretty interesting. So that's kind of an un unfortunate thing. Yeah, the Geneva double. Uh, a few years ago, it was forty to sixty thousand dollars, but unfortunately, um, uh, some of the world's greatest forgers or uh, forgers were born in Switzerland. And uh, Francis Fournier, uh, he had a business in uh, Switzerland, in Geneva, and he would send them out and uh, like. He would tell you, he wouldn't tell you that it wasn't real, but he would, um, he wouldn't tell you the stamp wasn't real, but he would send it, uh, and, and you just kind of, because of the price, you assumed it wasn't real. So he didn't get in trouble because he wasn't making a claim that it was a real stamp. But unfortunately what it did is put a bunch of fakes out on the market. And then a couple other famous Swiss forgers were uh, Sparati. I think we've all heard of him. If we know about forged stamps and Spiro. Um, both of them were from Switzerland. So while Swiss stamps are cool, they also had some cool forger, uh, forgers in there. Um, Do you collect forgeries by chance? Uh, yes, I'm sure I have some. And if I can get my hands on them, I would grab them. The thing with forged Swiss stamps is they still sell for quite a bit. Either people don't know and it drives the price up, or they're just collectible again because if you can spend $100, $200 on a forged stamp that's a $60,000 stamp, that's kind of probably the only way a lot of us are going to get that stamp in our collection. Um, but when I do know I have a forgery, I mark them forged in my in my album um, just to keep it straight. Is, is there an easy way to detect? Uh, there's books on these stamps and how they've been forged. Okay. And there's uh, at the end, there's a couple of good online resources I, I put in there. And, um, and I've got them in my older handout. And uh, you go on there and find all kinds of really good articles. Um, uh, there's, I mean, the internet's just really starting to fill up with that stuff. Steve, Steve sent me something the other day for Belgium, a uh, five franc, one of their highest valued stamps. And there's like, what, like 18 different forgeries of that darn thing? <laughs> yeah, but it was a really cool article because it just went into like 12 steps, like go through and look at these things on the stamp. And if something's not right, you probably got one of the forgeries, which was pretty cool. So um, Switzerland was the first to print a tricolor stamp. That's the the bot known as the Basel Dove stamp up there, and that was its color. It was that bluish green, and um, and then black and red. So those were the three colors that were printed on it. It's also an embossed stamp, um, which is pretty interesting. And that was done in 1845. Yes. July 1st, it came out, and it was fifth stamp in the world. So it was very early. Um, Swiss like to be first on stuff. Um, other firsts were, were the embroidered stamp, and I've got these to pass around. Um, the embroidered stamp, I've got one on cover that my mom happened to be over there visiting, and she sent me the cover. The funny thing is, is the postman canceled it, but he said they're being stolen. <laughs> Uh, they're ripping them off the envelopes, or the envelope's just not making it. So she actually stuck it in another envelope and mailed that to me. So it's really kind of a, it's not a first day cover, but it, it's definitely a philatelic item. Because uh, it's practically, you know, it's mint. It's got no wear and tear on it. And then uh, not only did they print the that stamp in a single, they printed it in the block, which I have a block here. And this thing has gone up in value quite a bit. If, what if you guys are that? Uh, that one was, the embroidered was in 2000. So um, I'll pass this around. But but it's actually on the back. It's got an adhesive, peel and stick adhesive. You peel off paper on the back and it'll stick to an envelope. And, and uh, it's just a beautiful, I just think it's a beautiful stamp. It was really cool. 
Um, I've got one here if somebody wants to see the real thing. Well, I got the real thing, just the block four. I have a single two uh, <laughs> here, but yeah, it's a neat, it's a neat stamp. Um, they also did the first artificial smelling stamp uh, in 2001. <laughs> You guys can guess up there which one it probably is. Not the wood one, it's the chocolate bar, of course. So uh, I'd ask you to not rub this, but I will pass the chocolate bar around. But uh, if you do brush your hand over it, it, it truly does smell like chocolate. Um, it's sort of an artificial chocolate, but it does smell like chocolate. And I think it's really cool to collect as an entire sheet because of a candy bar wrapper uh, edge. And each, each one of those things is a stamp then? Each one, yeah, so on these, each chocolate piece is a stamp. Oh, Just okay. like you break the chocolate bar up, yeah. you break up the sheet. <laughs> that was kind of ingenious. Um, is that a Celsius adhesive then? Uh, no, that is a, that yeah, is a uh, mm -hmm. it's got adhesive on the back, so you gotta moisten it. Um, then the, well, another- you know, like it on the back. <laughs> no, I don't know, I've never licked one, so I don't know, to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, and then uh, the third one is the wooden stamp, and it's actually a piece of veneer, and uh, I've got it in here. You can kind of feel the thickness. Um, you're welcome to look at this, but I've got it on. Uh, unfortunately, it's not on the full piece, but I've got it actually close to the use, which is kind of hard to get. Again, remember we talked about the, the one getting stolen all the time. These were, same thing was happening to these. So I, I stumbled across one of these in something I bought and thought it was really cool. So I just left it right the way it is. It's my only canceled one, but it's kind of cool that they were sticking it on mail and they were using it. So um, it's kind of tricky when you try to put it in a mount. I've got I've got the thing here. Yeah, it's a little bit thick. It is a little thick. Yeah, it's yeah. You guys thick. can definitely tell. You know, feel the thickness on it. But they just veneered wood and then printed on it. And then on the back, it's the same kind of self-adhesive type thing that's on the embroidery stamp. So I'll pass that around with the chocolate any, bar. I'm just curious, do you have information about how these things were manufactured? Uh, I haven't looked into it, but they used machines and embroidered them and then applied adhesive to them. Fancy embroidery machines. So, in fact, there's a couple versions of that block of four, four because apparently when the embroidery machine was done, as the the needle or whatever was leaving the sheet, it left like a little blue mark in it. And in one of the catalogs, it talks about there's two varieties and one of them's pretty rare. Um, uh, this uh, Swiss chocolate thing, are these stamps of different denominations on the same? No, thing? they are all, they're all 90. Oh, okay. Are you looking at the numbers at the bottom? Oh, right. Yeah, so he's asking about, it, they're kind of hard to read, but there's numbers down at the bottom. The 270 represents well, that row is two dollars. Yeah, that row is 270. This row is 540, and so on and so on. And they do that on a lot of full sheets because at the end of the day, you got to reconcile your tills. Yeah, I, can, I can see through the chocolate or 90. <laughs> yeah, so you got to reconcile your till at the post office, and that's the easiest way to do it because they they tear them from the high end of the sheet back, so that if they were to tear this off, they would know the sheet. The remainder in that sheet is 1080, and uh, there's a lot of a lot of post offices that do that. Germany does that quite a bit. So how long did those things stay on sale? Uh, usually that some of that stuff sells out pretty fast. Um, none of it's available through the post office anymore, obviously because it's quite a ways back. Um, the embroidered stamp. You can still find the single fairly easily. Um, you'll pay a little bit of a premium, but it's not terribly expensive. Uh, the block of four is very hard to get. I mean, there's guys selling them for $120 on eBay. Um, I had, I paid about 40 for mine when I got it, I think. Um, the chocolate bar is about $50 now. I mean, this is highly collectible, especially a sheet, it never hinged, not torn oh, up. $50 for the sheet. $50 for the sheet. Oh, no. Each stamp. No, not each stamp, no, $50 for each. Single stamps are fairly easy to come by. Um, definitely used ones are. Um, but typically about, you can buy stamps like that that are unique in the year sets. And the year sets last about two years on the post office's website and then they're off sale. Then they're gone. And uh, so, yeah, then, then they're a lot harder to come by. And the wooden stamps probably about it's it's probably 
kind of like the uh, the embroidered one to find. You know, it's maybe five, it's maybe eight or ten dollars to get one um, if you can find it. That's the problem. Is sometimes they're hard to find. Um, so then there's three languages that appear on Swiss stamps, and you can see in this set, this is a set from 1939, the, the, um, they aren't in the greatest order, because I just pulled this off the internet. Pretty, um, pretty close. Yeah, but the Swiss, uh, the top row uh, is Swiss, that's French. Um, the middle row is uh, Schweiz, uh, well, yeah, they mixed that up. But Landau, Schweitzer is the Landau Stellung. That's the German, so Schweitz. And then the Svizera, the S-V-I-Z-Z-E-R-A, that's Italian. And so does anybody know why you print three languages on Swiss stamps? It's a tri-language country. It is a tri-language country. So those are three of the languages. However, um, none of those are the official language of Switzerland. There's a fourth language in Switzerland. It is Romanish. There's a very small place in Switzerland that they speak it. They estimate there's only a few thousand people that speak it. But it is still considered the official language of Switzerland. Um, so it's kind of an interesting fact. Nowadays, you don't see the tri-language on it. You see more of that in the early, early 1900s. Now, what is fourth language? Is that go back to the Roman days? Or? Yeah, I, if I remember correctly, it's, um, let's see, uh, I don't have it here. Yeah, the, it's four languages. I think it's a Latin derivative. Um, what physical part of Switzerland is it? Ooh, I, I cannot remember. But I know, I know you can look it up and find out that information. I don't remember which of the 22 states it is. But it's one of the 22 states that they speak uh, Romanish. So next slide. So I talked a little bit about watermarks. These are straight out of the catalog. Um, I do, and they're hard to see, but they're on black. I do have a couple of stamps to pass around with the watermarks on the back, um, at least the cross. But there's a couple things. So WZ means Wasserzeichnen which is watermark. This is a true watermark on a Swiss stamp, that cross. And that you cannot see pretty much without fluid. There's every once in a while you can find a stamp that you can see that watermark, but almost always you have to put fluid on it to see it. Um, and really you only have to do that early 1900s when you're dealing with these and these together, trying to figure out which, which issue they were. Um, Later on, Switzerland abandoned this and only did that, and then they've abandoned watermarks completely because it's more expensive to make the paper. So now they put fibers in it or phosphorescence or other things in their stamps to, to get the machines to cancel and stuff like that. Um, this here, the cross, is not a true watermark. It's actually embossed, it was actually embossed on the stamp after after the stamp was cut out. And because of that, it shows up different and it shows up more often on dark surfaces. And there's two, two crosses. You can see one's fatter, one's skinnier. But when you start talking about the heights and stuff, you know, you're looking at 10.95 millimeters and 10.85 millimeters. <laughs> so it's like, oh, come on. And then uh, the other one, the one I can visually pick up is the distance between the two rings is 0.8, and the distance between the two rings on that is 0.45. That's a, more of a significant difference, and that's how I really tell them about a part. But if you're going to do a really Swiss, I would recommend you find a couple that you can see the watermark on the back, put them in a stock card, and use them as your reference. This is... One of my references, I don't use it too much anymore because I've looked at so many of them, I can usually tell. Um, um, but anyways, this is, a, this is <laughs> there are the watermarks on there. And the stamps I'm talking about that do that. Hey, Brian. Yeah. I've noticed if you have a bright light and you shine it across the edge, you mm -hmm. can actually see it. It's embossed. Yeah. You can usually see it on most stamps, uh -huh. so it makes it real easy. 
Yeah, and the stamps that, that do that are the very early Swiss stuff, the very front of the book. They're known as the standing helvetias, or the seated helvetias, and then there's standing helvetias too, and then there's the numbers. And so it's a lot of this stuff in here, and I'll, I'll, I'll have this out if people wanna kind of look through this. But those stamps um, are really, those stamps up to like 1907, those are, it's really important to get the perforations right, the watermark, the cross watermark correct, and the paper fibers, because all three of those things make a huge difference in the value of the stamp. It can go from a $1.50 stamp to a $150 stamp, just because of the watermark that's on it. When you are, if you do sort those stamps, the easiest way to do it, even with a Scott catalog, is to look for a date mark on the stamp, a cancel mark, because then you know what period it's in. You're like, well, it can't be anything in front of this because this is when it was postmarked, or, or it can't be anything after that because that's when it was postmarked. So it could be before, and then you just, so it narrows your search down a little bit. And in fact, this, the, the specialized catalogs even talk about if you can't distinguish what it is and there's no postmark, you gotta assume it's the cheaper one. So, um, but that, that's kind of a tricky thing for collecting. Um, this little thing is on the end, end, edge of the page in those catalogs. And what you do is, if you can see it, you can hold the you can hold the stamp underneath the page, and the widths are different. And the the width so the width between there the 8.85 and the 8.4. This is 8.85 millimeters. This is 8.4 millimeters. So I've had to wet a stamp on watermark fluid, slide it under there to see which one it is if I'm not sure. But again, that's where the catalogs can help out because they put it's almost like a gauge right in the catalog. Which is pretty cool. Hey Brian. Yep. These two have very different purse. Is that a way of telling them apart? It is. And I did that on purpose. The one on the right is the nine and a quarter perf set, and that one only comes with the wider watermark. The 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 ones they perfed at nine and a quarter only come in this watermark. So I know for sure that that's the right watermark. Because you look at some others and it's like, oh man, that's close. I can't, I can't quite tell. Um, just because they're not that, you know, the impression just wasn't that good for on the back of the stamp. Um, but yeah, perfs is another way to do it. The thing though in the catalog is when you're looking at perfs, there's 11 and a half by 12, there's 11 and three quarter by 11 and three quarter, and that makes a difference. And that's hard to tell, 11 yeah. and three quarter by 11 and three quarter and 11 and a half by 12. And stuff like that. Um, 11 to 11 and 3 quarter you can kind of do and I actually have a perf gauge. Some perf gauges do those quarter perfs but I actually picked up years ago a perf gauge that only has Swiss perforations on it. Doesn't have anything else. It's just for the Swiss early stamps which is kind of cool. I have a question. Yep. In Scots they list a stamp and a up above it's a perf 11 and a half and it's not times something it has a dash and then 11 and three quarters so there that's where the scott catalog doesn't differentiate mm -hmm. they're saying that the stamp comes in 11 and a half and 11 and three quarter either one either one okay and so scott's is kind of lumping them together okay. and cataloging them together and uh the swiss catalog separated out in fact earlier Earlier Swiss catalog, earlier Swiss Scots don't show as much differentiation. You want a newer Scots because the couple of the collecting societies went to Scots and said, hey, you guys need to start recognizing this, these stamps. They are completely different than, than the regular ones. And so, um, so Scott actually listened to them and said, okay, we'll put some more varieties. So, in early Switzerland, there's a lot of sub letters. There's 76 and 76A, and mm -hmm. A is that second perf that they started to recognize. Um, so Switzerland's full of, of, what do they call those numbers, the sub numbers or whatever uh, in the catalogs. The, Switzerland's full of that for that reason. Um, another one, and I've got an example of, of a grill, and again, it's, you really gotta look at the light, but it's the exact same stamp. 
here um, with the grill. But if you look at the 40 center here, it came in both. And if you look, you kind of see some dots, you know, on the back of the stamp and they go across and up and down. That's kind of the pattern they create and the patterns across the entire back of the stamp. It's, 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 uh, so the entire back of the stamp was, was grilled. And, uh, and then it, without grill, it's pretty easy to tell. So in the card I'm gonna pass around, the one on the left is grilled and the one on the right is ungrilled. Um, the reason why they did that is they did it to keep, when they applied the gun to the stamps, to keep the stamp from curling, from applying the gun. And that's the only reason why they grilled Swiss stamps. And were those grilled prior to printing? Um, is, the, is the paper itself that's grilled? I, ooh, I don't know if the, I, you know, I'm not 100% sure whether the paper was grilled before the stamp was printed or after. I think it was after, because they applied a gun last after they print stamps. So, or Swiss did. Um, so I think, I think it was after, but that's still, that's a good question. I don't remember if I have that. The footnote says it was applied with the gummy to counteract the tendency. Oh, with the gum. So yeah. the gum was already on it, then they grilled it? Apparently okay. before they did so it they simultaneously. Grilled it, they grilled it after the gum was applied? It just says with the gummy, so they're hedging their bets there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know one thing is, is it can be easier to see the grill with the gum still on the stamp. It's almost like it loses some of its depth once that gum soaked off. Um, but once you, I mean, Dave, uh, um, Dennis was having a hard time figuring out grills, but once I showed him several, now I think he's got it because you start looking at them and you're like, oh, okay, that's what these things look well, like. Well, you have to have an on grilled and a grill side by side and you look at them in a the bright yeah. light, then you can say, oh yeah, that one's grilled. Yeah. But Alone, it's, uh, it's a little tough, yeah, yeah. Um, the best way I find the grills is I hold them to a bleak light, you know, hold them at an angle and, and move them around to, like, it, to see if I can see anything. And the stamp really needs to be a clean stamp on the back, because there's a lot of hinge remnants or any paper or anything, you're not going to be able to tell whether it's a grill stamp. So how many of the grills? Oh, um, there's, oh, I don't know, there's probably 40 or 50 grilled stamps. Uh, maybe more. Or maybe more. Well, it there's went into the 19. More, more than that. Yeah. Is there more than that? It well, went, you get in the back of the book with the, uh, oh, the officials and stuff. And yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. They quit grilling stamps in probably, uh, 1940. <laughs> yeah. The, they quit grilling stamps. I was reading up an article about some printing, doing some research for this. <laughs> you know, the Swiss printer, printing presses and stuff just kept getting better. And I'm sure gum techniques and, and, and uh, formulations kept getting better too. So, and then finally, some Swiss stamps do not have Helvetia printed on them. They don't say anything. And in fact, these are listed in the front of the Scott catalog in the stamp identifier section because a lot of people don't know what they have. So up here, these are postage due stamps. Um, they say nothing. These were pretty controversial in Switzerland. I have an article. I can make a photocopy for somebody if they're interested in reading up on it. But these... Um, what they did is they intended to print, they, they wanted to print some postage due stamps to, to collect that, that, that extra postage and they didn't want to use regular stamps. So they looked at it as these are never going to leave the country because they're not meant to be on outgoing postage. So we don't need to put the country name on them. They're just internal use only. So that's why they don't have the, the name on them. Now these ended up starting to say Helvetia and put a little cross on them. So later, um, that stuff, they did start putting the name on them, but the early ones they did not. The only unique thing about these is there's, oh, well, there's a couple things. There's 22 stars on them. Those are for the 22 cantons in Switzerland. And then they made uh, different numbers. I don't have a picture of the one cent. The one cent up here, the, the one cent is a blue, and it actually has a, a sun ray uh, in it. So from the center rays, uh, go out inside inside the circle here, but what it did is it made it really hard to read So it's the only postage due just the one cent has the rays in it all the others don't they they took the 
dies and ground that out and then printed them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, because it just, it bugged them when they were doing proofs and other things. Um, but as you can see up here, you know, there's a blue series and then there's green and there's this like pale green, there's like an olive green, there's this bright green. And then too, if you look at some of the numbers and I have examples if anybody wants to look at them, there's like this carmine red, there's this light red, um, you know, a very light red there. There are multiple shades of red and there are multiple shades of, of green in there and blue too. There's different ultramarines uh, in there. Um, and so the blue stamps change color too. But um, Scott just lists kind of some of the basic ones, but there's a whole lot more out there. They also, you also have to deal with grilling on those and you have to deal with the crosses, the different watermarks. All three watermarks exist on those, those stamps. And, so, the, and the frame around and the fr Yeah, and I'll talk about the frame. So, so the difficult there, then the added difficulty is the frame. They, I, I'm trying to remember, the article says how it, they, the frame got flipped on them, on them when they would take them out to clean them and put them back. The other thing is each stamp was an individual die. And so like with the penny black, you could recreate the sheets and stuff. These you can't because when they took them out to clean them, different ones got put back in. So no two sheets oh. are the same <laughs> after years of printing or whatever. So it, they're kind of a mess, but there are, this, the catalog talks about it. Um, this isn't the greatest one. I don't have a good pointer for up there, but if you guys, you know, use the mouse here. Um, Well, anyways, uh, right down here where this this corner frame comes to a point, you can see the point up there. Right up there, where that where that point comes down and turns into a single line, um, its position with the star tells you if the frame's upside down or not. That's the absolute easiest way to figure it out. If it's hitting the top of the star, it's I think it's a normal. If it's hitting lower on the star, it's uh, it's an inverted frame. And that's the easiest way to tell those. There's I'll pass it around and show you guys. For a particular denomination, there's like 24 varieties of it because of that. The color, the the uh, the red or the carmine in the middle, mm -hmm. and the frame inverted or not, and the watermark. So, I mean, you start multiplying all that out and you've got half a dozen pages if you can find them all. Yeah, it, it can get pretty, pretty crazy. Um, I'll pass this around, but basically, if you look on here, there's a, a three, uh, number three. So I'll pass this, this around. This explains the, the inverted and the not. If you look at number three here on the top, you'll see they've drawn a little line where that point is and where it hits the star. And it's just plain as day once you see that um, on there. That, that where it, the, the one on the left in that picture is a, a normal frame and the other one is inverted. Were, so. were, were any of these being printed privately? No, this was all, the Swiss government um, had hired contractors, you know, companies in Switzerland to print this. I have a whole article about those postage due stamps and in that article, I, some of it I, found, I was given years ago, it even shows the printings and how many were printed. The Swiss keep, immaculate records and I mean it's down that that article tells you how many were rejected and the whole nine yards I mean it's 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 a bore <laughs> read but but it's interesting to learn a little bit about why stuff got inverted that it talks about grinding out the frames and how they were dumped and cleaned and put back together so no two sheets are the same they didn't track them there's some of that information in there that's pretty good so And then couple, two more slides from so almost done. So Switzerland uh, usually only issues two semi-postals. There are a few other ones out there now. Um, there's Pro Juventuta and Pro Patria. And you can see one's for the children and one's for the nation. So for the children was for orphanages. And for the nation goes to things in Switzerland that are, um, go to like museums and things like that where they're, where they're, um, where they're, uh, 
fields where, where they're where they're just say you know where they're just doing stuff that 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 shows Swiss culture and and stuff about nationality um, things that are Swiss you know I, I know money in the past has gone to outdoor air museums where they have traditional buildings it's gone to art museums where famous Swiss artists work is to help curate that stuff um, the money can go to to you know they're famous for embroidery. You can go to embroidery stuff to buy collections and things like that. So most of that money goes to things that are that Switzerland's known for, wood carving, things like that. Um, and so that's what the money goes to. Um, and they started the the children the children ones for orphanages back in 1912, and the other one back in 1938. And if you collect them, they're some of my favorite stamps because. Um, if you look at some of the topics on there and when you have them in a book, they're just beautiful. They, you know, there's, this one is, this is stuff from the, this is stuff from the sixties and, uh, um, fifties and sixties and butterflies on here and flowers. And I, they're just some of the very topical stamps. And then, um, back in the, in the other ones here, um, they did, I know Steve likes these, they did minerals, um, they have different mineral stamps, they have, um, and they also did, uh, as on there with that series from 52, there's a lot of etchings and stuff, scenery, things like that. They did uh, houses uh, around uh, farms, stuff like that. So they did some, there's some really interesting stuff. You guys can take a look at this too. How do they you put the semi post what marking is that? Um, if you look at here, you got the 30 and 10, or the 40, 10. Oh, okay, so it's just, it's a yeah, so it's augment the postage. Yeah, it's augment the postage. Okay. So you're going to pay 50 for it. It's only worth 40 on an envelope. Right. And they just issue a set each year. That's it. And that's the nice thing about collecting those, is you don't end up with, you know, 10,000 stamps after 100 years. And Brian? Yeah. They put out souvenir sheets, too. And they those do. are expensive. Yes, they do. Yeah, depending on the souvenir sheet, they do them for a lot of philatelic expositions. They would issue semi-postal sheets and um, some things like that. So there are some expensive sheets out there for Switzerland. I have I have another that that binder in there. It's got some of the sheets in it. I know Dennis has his with him. So um, so like I said, it's not always just for those two causes. They do a few other semi-postals out there, but. Really, Switzerland is pretty conservative when it comes to those. And then a couple good references out there are the Philatelic Society of Great Britain, that they're huge Swiss collectors. Um, and then the American uh, Philatelic Society, or Helvetia Philatelic Society. They're, they're a big uh, organization. I belong to them. Um, they do a news, nice newsletter and they have great, uh, both sites have excellent archives on, you guys were asking about forgeries, how do you know? A lot of stuff is on those two websites about how to tell forgeries. Um, I mean, I stumbled across an article about the Zurich four and six, the grayish ones at the beginning. And I mean, they're talking about how many cross lines there are and just everything you can think of on how to identify those. So. Can I ask you another question about the printing? Uh -huh. Switzerland is a small country. Mm -hmm. I think 9 million people. Yeah, I don't know what the current population is, but uh, yeah. How big is the press run? Um, well, let's see, the catalog. Uh, the catalog I'm passing around has press runs in it. Um, I'm just going to look at this real quick. And send uh, okay, so here's an example. In, um, <laughs> like, when, when are you thinking? Like, what? what well, I mean, we print hundreds of millions of stamps. Mm -hmm. you know, each of these, I mean, I mean, there can't be that many stamps used. The other question, of course, which goes along with it, how many stamps are issued each year? Typically? Well, like here in 05, there was, uh, there was some stamps, 1.3 million of them were issued. Here's another set from 05 where they issued, um, it was two set, they issued 1.6 of the lower denomination and 1.4 of the higher denomination. So, you know, uh, Switzerland, like I've been by the, the year sets got expensive for a few years, just like a lot of countries did. Now they're back down to normal. I think a year set is about 
80 or 90 dollars to get all the commemoratives everything issued all the semi-postal commemoratives everything except once in a while you don't get a certain souvenir sheet or something but almost always you get that you don't get the block but little blocks miniature blocks and stuff is, is it harder to come by the canceled stamps than the new stamps depends in the 1930s and 20s the mint stuff is cheaper than the used. The used stuff is more expensive in semi-postal. Because people just didn't use it as much. You know, the depression was going on, you're paying a premium for a stamp. They hadn't caught on yet. So used early semi-postal is more expensive. Um, and then it just depends on the set. Uh, typically, the very early stuff, the mint is more expensive. Um, in fact, the, um, we talked about the postage due um, those things, because they could only be issued by a post office clerk, um, they didn't get out to the public in mint, and the ones that did, you can't afford them. They're so expensive. They're, some of the catalogs don't even list them as mint. You mentioned there are 22 cantons, but there's way more now, uh, 25, 26 emblems that are coat of arms. Or 26? What's the difference? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. There may be some city emblems. Uh, well, that's that's one emblem. That's one emblem. Uh, I didn't count them. I just pulled that off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Bad me. All I read is the 22 stars were the 22 cantons on the postal. So that's why I mentioned that. It could be more. I